this whole conversation was precipitated by a few few events. Um, in maybe about six or seven years ago, I wrote an article for the Huffington Post about my suspicion that uh, being black in North America leads to post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, I have Director X um, and Dr. Kamala Huzel. You are a doctor of psychology. You've been practicing specifically, and you're the CEO of your own practice, which is a very prominent mental health practice in North Carolina. But I want to get a little bit of history on what your background is and what your specialty is, because I believe it relates very specifically to the conversation we're having here today. Absolutely, absolutely. So I'm a licensed clinical mental health counselor, and I have over 20 years of experience with um, incapacities such as um, clinical supervision, psychotherapy, um, counselor education, and being an instructor of psychology. A lot of your clients, if I'm not mistaken, are veterans, are members of law enforcement, and outside of that professional scope, happen to be people of color, significantly black people in, in the in general population, who are dealing specifically with post-traumatic stress disorder. I was born in Trinidad when I was five. My family moved to Edmonton, Alberta. I grew up in Edmonton, Alberta from five till about 17 years old. Uh, at that time in Edmonton, Alberta, there are very few black families. I remember often, very often, going to school in the morning, cold winter mornings, get on the bus, looking for an available seat, several available seats. And I remember thinking, oh, I'm not gonna sit next to that woman because she's gonna grab her purse. Or oh, I'm not gonna sit next to that person because of X, Y, Z. Or they're gonna think it's blah, 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 right? Because uh, you come to that age where you stop being cute and you become a threat, right? And I would just find myself at the back of the bus. And every time I do that, I think, Rosa Parks had to go to the back of the bus. Damn, here I'm at the back of the bus and I don't have to, but I'm doing this, right? But it basically it becomes a sort of conditioning, right? So that is a symptom. You are going to sit somewhere else. Instead of stopping at the second seat, you go into the seventh seat. As a as people of color, we are often aware of our surroundings. <laughs> right, right, right. Of past experiences, right? Yeah, and I, I can speak to that very clearly. I make sure I go and I'm in a mixed mixed race crew and I'd be on location and I'm very cognizant of the fact that my experience at that location may be different than the rest of my crew's experience at that location. My back is to the wall, I see the main entrance and the exit is right there. I'm very cognizant of that. Okay, now X, with that, right? You are a victim of of gun violence. I watched your TED Talk. It's a very powerful TED Talk. I encourage anybody out there who has not watched it to go and watch it. Um, you're a victim of gun violence. I was not uh, the target of yeah. it. You know what I'm saying? I was just standing somewhere. And yeah. I was shot in my back at a party. Well, it went through two people and hit me. So I did a TEDx Toronto called, entitled Message to the Man Who Shot Me. And we talk about the brain of violent and aggressive people and how you get to have a brain in that state and how meditation can repair that, what they call damage. And, and it's, it's a sensitive word for people to say it, but it's brain damage. And um, we started this organization called Operation Prefrontal Cortex. And our mission is to reduce gun, mass and police violence through meditation. And uh, that is the work we're doing in the city. And anywhere anywhere else that's interested, we will hop right on in and, and give what we can. Did you change how you operated pre and post that experience? Not really, but there are things, you know, a balloon popping can shake me in a, a way deeper than it affects other people. This kind of goes to my suspicion, you know, my belief that uh, black people in North America, people of color in North America are living with post-traumatic stress disorder in the same way that veterans are, maybe on, on different scales. Um, but I would love to hear, what is, what is the definition of post-traumatic stress disorder? What is the symptomology of post-traumatic stress disorder? And what is this diagnosis? Post-traumatic stress disorder, or you, you normally hear it um, referred to as PTSD. It is a disorder that sometimes occurs when a person is exposed to a traumatic or frightening experience. And so PTSD doesn't occur in everybody. 
So what's traumatic for you might not be traumatic for me, right? So we don't always feel that that particular situation was traumatic. In order for a person to have a positive diagnosis of PTSD, there's a number of um, symptoms that they must exhibit for at least a month. So things like nightmares, flashbacks, avoidance, as you mentioned, avoidance of certain situations, um, irritability, exaggerated startle response, explosive anger, um, impulsive behaviors. As I tell you from my experiences, I've walked into to locations and there's like uh, people writing racial slurs on the wall. I've walked in locations, I see sambos on the wall. I walk in locations, uh, people tell me I should be hanging from a tree by a rope, etc., etc., etc. So as I maneuver through many of these states all over the country, I find myself uh, being very cognizant of my surroundings. When I roll up, how I roll up, what roads I take to get there. Um, once I arrive there, I come on location. I make sure I know where every single exit in that location is in case I need to go. I'm asking, poking around, asking the people taking out the garbage to the owner of the restaurant, what the environment is like, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? It definitely is damaging. And when we experience trauma, there's damage to our minds, to our mental health, to our brains. Mm -hmm. And so then we have to not only deal with that trauma, we also have to continue trying to stay at the top of our game. Mm -hmm. So we have this double whammy at this point. If we're talking about post-traumatic stress, I think we should talk about what, what, what does stress do to your brain? Stress shrinks your prefrontal cortex. That's where decision-making happens. And it enlargens your amygdala, right? And that's emotional control. If you wanted to think about a bow and arrow, think about your brain as a bow and arrow, or just a bow. And your arrow being your actions, the front part of the bow, that's your prefrontal cortex. That's your decision-making. This part, the string that you hold back, that's your amygdala, right? Control of your emotions and the ability to aim that thing. So imagine if you had a small finger holding on here and there you're holding on with it. That's the opposite of how you're supposed to work a bow and arrow. And that's what happens to stress. It gives you less, less hand and too much hand. And when you meditate, it changes it. Meditation gives volume to your prefrontal cortex and shrinks your amygdala. So you're back to where you should be. And your emotions and your decision makings can work together and you aim it and let it go when you need it to. Feel what I'm saying? And hit your proper target. So the stress does that and so does childhood abuse and neglect. Childhood abuse and neglect is the same thing. Ignoring your kid and hitting your kid are the same thing, right? Which gets us into high school shooters. You're like, well, the parents gave him everything he wanted. Yeah, how'd they get it? Well, they work all the time. Who was home? Nobody. They neglected the child. So these things, these things combine um, together and they create a brain. The, a person whose prefrontal cortex is too small and their amygdala is too big uh, become more violent and aggressive in their behavior. And to top it all off, your uh, fight or flight response gets locked in. Your hippocampus, which controls memory and your amygdala, hardwire in your fight or flight response. That's what happens there because your amygdala, your amygdala gets information just a fraction of a second faster than your prefrontal cortex. It makes sure your emotions decide if they're gonna turn, it can turn off, it, can, it turns off your prefrontal cortex. The blackout, the, if you've ever had a blackout when you got really angry, that's what that is. Your prefrontal, your amygdala shut off your prefrontal cortex. So we're just doing instinct, no time for thinking. And the moment, the, the moment of decision doesn't exist because there wasn't a decision. You didn't make the decision. The machine said enough. And then that, that compounds too, because like, you know, you watch the news, everybody looking at their feeds or, or they're out in the world experiencing things. And like you said, you hear a balloon pop and that, that's a, a trigger for you. So we're dealing with these post-traumatic stress triggers. And then you watch the news and you see, you know, George Floyd, you know, I grew up, I saw Rodney King. We see all of these things happening that are very specifically happening to people who look like us. 
people go to people who look like them for mental health healing. But when there are not a lot of people who look like you who are helping you to heal, how does that how does that manifest and how does how do you change that narrative? Black folks in therapy is kind of new. You know, it's not yet last year new. So who was doing this work? about 15 years ago on how many of us were doing this work, right? So you had just one side of it doing that work. You had a bunch of white therapists, you had a bunch of white people going to therapy. Yeah. So now here we come, here come the minorities, here come the people of color. And hopefully this trajectory won't be, won't take as long as it did or would have if we didn't have so many people of color now and um, focused on mental health. We can't change the world and system. That's going to take. It's going to. It's going to. It's, it's going to take mass movement. Yeah. Mass movement and, and and direct action. It's going to have. You know what I mean? But meditation and exercise together will give you the tools to deal with the world that's coming at you. How you react to it. We are all interacting with each other. So the best thing to do is to make sure that everybody in all of this diversity that we have. Make sure that everyone is doing their part of it and not just black folks doing their part, but making sure everybody's doing their part of it so that we can we can navigate through society together in a in a peaceful way um, and also as equitable as possible. What I think we need to do is remind white folks of, of a tradition they have forgotten, um, the abolitionist tra tradition, the white people that got it popping on the black part of black folks. And I, and I I don't mean like we're having a protest. I mean like load the muskets. Yeah. <laughs> load the muskets. Time to free these slaves. We've had enough. You know what I'm saying? There is a very strong tradition in the white community of standing up for what's right. There is a, there is a white guilt where it feels like every time they think about black people, they're the bad guys. Not always. John Brown was for real. You ever heard of Cassius Clay, the original Cassius Clay? Probably not. Not, not Muhammad Ali Cassius Clay. The white abolitionist Cassius Clay played no games, freed his slave. For those who don't know, watching, freed all his slaves. He was a slave owner. Heard a, heard a speech by abolitionists, came home and freed them all in Kentucky. Uh, started a school, a multicultural school, a multiracial school that you got to for free. Like there's, like I said, there's a great tradition of uh, our white brothers and sisters that know the, know the score, playing for keeps. And um, like I said, that sometimes you just need to hear about it to get inspired by it and, and, and get back on track. We're all connected. We are all connected, spiritually, physically, emotionally. Everybody is connected. And in some connections are deeper and more obvious than others, but we all are connected. We're lucky enough to be in this big awakening, right? Mm -hmm. And see see what's going on. Because we've reached the, I mean, the the planet itself is in, lies in the balance. This is not a, it's not a, this is not the usual period of, social unrest. Human extinction is on the table. What we are witnessing is the, the, the eventual overhaul of our entire system. And the big one is in our schools. Our children should be exercising and meditating every single day. Um, their marks get better, their meditation, their entire lives improve. The earlier you start, the earlier you start meditating um, and exercising, your whole life changes. And um, for people who that is what they're dealing with in life, that's the combo. Yeah, I love what you said about uh, exercise and meditation because, you know, you can put on some shoes and go walk. You can learn how to do the meditation practice 15 minutes a day. So that's a big part. That's a big part of our battle. How do we bring mindfulness and meditation to uh, the people who need it most? You guys on an international scale, having these kinds of conversations and making it normalized, making mental health, making meditation, making these things normalized, this is going to help us tremendously as a people. We walk, we meditate, we eat healthy, and we take care of the people around us. We build diverse businesses, platforms, communities, and we spread the love, right? I think that that's the, that's the cumul accumulation of this message here today. And make art, whatever it is, make art, it feeds the soul, you know? And thank you very much, everyone, for your time and what your contribution to this conversation is very meaningful and important to me personally, so thank you.